Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here. Do I use a mic for this portion of the program? Yes. Yes, I do. Hello. <laughs> I am so excited to be here with you guys tonight. We have fabulous guests. So I'm going to read out their bios for you, and then I'm going to bring them on stage for us to start asking questions. Okay, so Mike Odell. He's been an agent for over 20 years. Mike contributes his love of the arts and love of artists in the VO department at Bobby Ball Agency. Combining his years of experience and ear for talent, he is always eagerly at work for his clients while remaining available to them. His clients have booked animated series, pizza company spokesman contracts, the voice of Conoco, and NHL hockey promos, in addition to countless commercials. Additionally, both youth and adult clients enjoy booking work from animated episodes and series regular, Tom Belief, Junior on the Job, Family Guy, just to name a few. Blessed with a versatile roster, Mike is always on the search for interesting new talent who he can assist in beginning and enlarging a voiceover career. And our second guest is Dean Panero. Dean is a renowned voiceover agent with a reputation for having a keen ear for talent and for dedicating himself to building a talent roster that is second to none. He spent a number of years honing his skills as a talent agent while at ICM Partners, as a partner at DPN Talent, and as VP talent agent at Abrams Artist agency before launching his own agency, Dean Panero Talent, in 2018. Please help me welcome Mike and Dean. Hello. <laughs> I know. Look at all these faces. We have a lot of good stuff to talk about tonight. I'm super excited to get started. So my first question is just the general, what, what brought you to voiceover? Uh, and why do you love it? Well, mine was a uh, chance meeting at uh, Divine Design um, 20 years ago with uh, famous talent agent Jeff Danis. He uh, had just lost one of his agents and I struck up a conversation with him and I was working downtown Los Angeles doing some litigation support, which is basically document management for large law firms. It's like Kinko's for large law firms. So I was a, a sales guy. But Jeff uh, ran what was at the time one of the best voiceover departments in the country. I didn't know anything about voiceover at the time. Uh, voiceover was not in the public consciousness like it is now. I mean, I knew that The Simpsons existed. Um, but I didn't really know anything about voiceover and um, I told him what I did he said oh that sounds like crap you should come work for me and <laughs> and I did and so um, it's just one of those things right place right time where I got to work with the right guy at the right time who was at the top of his game and I learned a tremendous amount uh, I had the best client list in town and uh, it's just one of those things that I sort of fell in love with um, so Right place, right time, like a lot of things in life. Yep, great. Mike? What was the question? <laughs> How did you find your way into ah, voiceover? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Uh, 2008, I was a commercial agent at BBA, and the Screen Actors Guild announced that they were going to entertain the option of striking the commercial contract for 2009. And about 28 seconds after that was announced, AFTRA said, well, we're not. Mm -hmm. And at that point, all the VO was going through the AFTRA contracts. So I went to our owner and said, we should probably think about opening up a voiceover department just so people have something to do, if nothing else, during the strike. And she said, that's a good idea. Go ahead. <laughs> and I said, N um, no, that's not quite what I meant. Just she said, well, if we have a strike coming, I'm not going to hire somebody else to come in here and start a new department. And I said, well, you could at least count on them to know what they were doing. And that didn't go over well either. So uh, literally, we started from scratch, and uh, we talked to the uh, contracts people at AFTRA and got some knowledge there. And we talked to a few coaches and casting directors around town. And the first thing I noticed was how supportive the voiceover community is. Mm -hmm. um, I won't say as compared to anything else, but it is very supportive. Yeah. And the artists are really, uh, really supportive of each other. And it was just a real nice 
uh, art form for actors, and I think it's still the best one. I really do. I mean, there's just so many, many, many things you can do with your voice that you can't do with your body. Uh, and that's, holy mackerel, that's 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that happened. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I want to kind of get down to brass tacks. I want to delve into demo reels. The beloved demo reel. Great. Okay, so a few questions. Do we want separate reels for commercial, promo, interactive, and animation? How do you make a demo reel stand out? Um, and Dean in particular, because I know I've, I've heard you speak on this before and it kind of shooketh me. Can you talk about the natural voice and the likable lead and folding that into an animation or any kind of uh, demo reel and the importance of that? Well, so for, I'm gonna jump around here a little bit. Yeah. So for many years, the number one demo you wanted was a commercial reel, no question about it. Um, it it's the way you got an agent. It was, because in commercials, they want new, fresh, and different. The ad agencies are always looking for new, fresh, and different. Um, the last 10 years, you don't put a commercial reel together, putting all of your biggest conflicts in, in, the, in your demo because they'll listen to it and think, oh, they have a conflict in that area. You actually want to put smaller conflicts in commercial demos. So commercial demo is still the main demo to, to, to create, but the demo that I use the most and send out the most without question is a promo demo. The networks and the, the people hiring promo actors, they still listen to demos more than anybody else. Um, so promo demos are very important. With that said, the whole town is in love with animation demos. And I, I, it's a cottage industry of people making animation demos in this town. And um, what you notice over and over again is they hit all the tropes, the witch, the Jewish, Jewish mother, the southerner, um, you know, these, the character voice after character voice after character voice. And what is always missing is the lead. Uh, the, the, where's the mom, the likable mom that does all the hard work and where's the, the dad who's not really as dumb as he acts like he is. Um, instead of doing wacky character voices for your animation demo, think about doing leads and likable characters because likability is very underrated in animation and you can, you can combine interactive and animation in my opinion, very much so. Um, but instead of going straight for the straight out of central casting characters go for leads that lend themselves to what you do naturally. Um, so I've, I, I over and over hear animation demos um, where they're trying to show you this mythical range that they have. And the reality of animation in 2020, it's nailing jokes. It's not wacky character voices. It's, it's understanding that it's a joke to begin with. Um, animation is so popular right now and so prevalent. All the writers are mining pop culture for memes. And um, so these writers uh, need to hear that you even recognize that it is a joke. They don't want to hear that you can do a character voice. They want to hear that you can nail a joke with great timing. So I focus way more on on humor and comedy and uh, less on wacky character voices. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes, very good point. Uh, I think that the, you, you should, particularly if you're beginning, uh, focus on the commercial demo first mm -hmm. and have that be your strong suit uh, because more than anything else, and I can only speak for my agency, uh, we get far more uh, commercial auditions for voiceover than we do uh, animation and interactive. I mean, and that's because there are more commercials than there are animated shows and interactive shows or games. Uh, and I don't have a problem either uh, with the animation or interactive combination. I do have a problem combining anything else in there. Commercials are for commercials. Anything else is separate. Uh, and do not go after any of those demos unless you have studied and gotten as good as you think you're going to get at this point because there's nothing like dropping fifteen hundred dollars that's going to be obsolete in six months because suddenly you've improved so make certain that you've had the proper amount of instruction coaching etc cetera, etc cetera, before you drop that kind of money on any demo because it's easy to tell who's only done commercials when they're trying to 
rhythmically sound like a squeaky character in an animated demo, and that's just not what sells. Very easy to tell that. I think you kind of just touched on my next question, but it was a, it was kind of regarding the idea of uh, a lot of actors want to save money and self-produce their demos. What do you say? Never. <laughs> yeah. Never. Ever. 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 Don't build your own unless engine it's, unless it's actual real commercials. Right. Right. Then you can just go ahead and put your commercials together. Sure. But to create a, a, a homemade demo. Yeah. Yeah, that's a mistake. And I would even have an engineer if you Probably. even you uh -huh. got the material. Yeah. Have you ever signed anybody who hasn't had an amazing demo, just out of curiosity? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh huh. Absolutely. And how has that yeah. happened? In what in what set of circumstances? Well, you know, if one of your top actors, um, because referrals are one of the mm -hmm. ways I get my best people. You know, no question about it. So, and I'm actually kind of terrible when it comes to this. A lot of my clients don't have demos. A lot of them. Mm. Um, because like I said, referrals are a huge thing for me. If one of my top actors says, listen, this person is awesome, I'm gonna listen to them because they're in sessions with them. You know, and, and what happens is somebody will come back from a session and say, Dean, I read with this girl today. She was unbelievable. She's unsigned, you gotta meet her. And not only because they make, you know, $20,000 a year for me, but because they're probably right, I'm gonna bring that person in. Right. And um, uh, it's almost, it, for the last 10 years, it's almost a selling point for for actors without voiceover demos. I say this to the to the buyers, they're an actor, they're not voiceover people because they want actors. So I say, they don't have a demo here, I'll send you a spot that they did from an audition, but they don't have a demo because they're not voiceover people. These are actors, they're not voiceover. And it's a selling point mm -hmm. for certain people. Now, I, I'm getting beyond that a little bit. It's, you know, it's, uh, you, you should have a demo, you really should. It's, it can, it can make the difference, but um, I definitely signed many people without voiceover demos. And I have too, uh, but it's been a condition that they're going to get one. Okay. Um, but it is, uh, the way that the, the nature of the business today, now that everything's gone digital, uh, if someone asks me about someone, I say, well, I've got, yes, I do have someone, but there's no demo, you just send me something for them to read. Mm -hmm. And then they'll do that, and I'll give it back, and they'll say, "Fine, having you know, whatever." Yep. Uh, but that does not relieve them of the responsibility. Mm -hmm. They do have to have a demo because that opens them up to the other six hundred production companies that aren't going to do that. Right. Because yeah. nobody nobody books from a demo. Nobody gets booked from their demo ever. You've got to read the script. It's mm -hmm. been that way for twenty years. So, the reason you can get away with not having a demo is you you're gonna have to read the script. If it's George Clooney, I guarantee he read for Budweiser when he booked that. They make you read, you right. know? They've gotta hear it. Yep, so. everybody reads in voiceover, that's something. Everybody yeah. reads. Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay, so your roster. You obviously believe and love your roster. You believe in your roster. What, what is the difference between somebody on your roster who is doing good work and everything is fine versus your Barbie dream talent on your roster. What makes somebody just sing for you? Well, the, the talent has to be there. Yep. You cannot get away without being talented in this town. There are too many people that want to do this. So the talent has to be there. But next, you have to be available. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times um, somebody tells me they're going to go pick up somebody from an airport so they can't make an audition. Um, being <laughs> available is a huge part. Just being cool in general is so important. Being available, saying yes to every audition, not, hey, can you move that 15 minutes back so I can do this or move it an hour? The people that are most successful, without question, are the ones that just say yes over and over to every audition, every booking, you know, if they're, you know, because we hold, these days we hold our clients' calendars. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I, it rings in my head, I can think of people that I know want to have the career of my top people, but every friggin' time I call them, they're like, can we move this 15 minutes? You know, and it's just a bummer for an agent, it's a bummer for production, it's a bummer for casting, because every 15 minute move, there's like a series of three mm -hmm. phone calls that have to happen. Um, so without question, assuming the talent is equal, 
just say yes, be available. There's, you know, there's nothing you have better to do unless it's a booking and then the agent most likely knows about it. And in that case, he's hopefully already moving it around. So um, be available, say yes, be cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. You really still have clients who use the airport excuse? <laughs> they're, they're actors, they can't help themselves. <laughs> Well, yeah, but nobody goes to pick up anybody at the airport anymore. They just, you know, they just don't do it. Take, take but the But it's bus. a really good friend. <laughs> Are they paying you to do that? No. Am I getting 10% of that? No. Then go to the audition. Um, I, I, I agree, again, with Dean. And, but you know, after a while, just you know, standing on the same street corner for so long, you start to recognize who's who. Yep. And... You know who your go-getters are. The talent, again, being equal. You know who's going to go above and beyond the call of duty to get this done. And who is going to come to the conservatory things. You know, who's going yeah. to be an active member right. of the voiceover community. And if you're going to be a voice actor, go where the voice actors are. If you're going to be a director, you go over there. But voice actors, you're here. Mm -hmm. And that's a very big, big, big telling point because, I mean, even those who aren't blessed with all the talent in the world, uh, make connections and they start knowing people and they, they're in class all the time and you know who knows where the next job is going to come from mm -hmm. so yeah there's a there's a work ethic is immense yeah. well to kind of double down to on what you said earlier um, about getting better as well so maybe you're not where you should be every six months as a voice actor if you're newer to it you're going to get exponentially better and then six months later you'll get exponentially mm -hmm. better so the making a demo six months into your voiceover career is probably a mistake unless you're already signed and your agent thinks you're great but you know you're gonna get better every six months for like three years and six months later you'll look back and be like i suck six months ago <laughs> six months later you'll look back and be like wow i was terrible how did anybody even listen to me that'll happen every six months for like three years and then after three years you're probably pretty good by then and you'll look back and you'll or you'll think you know what okay i think now is the time so don't make a demo too early mm -hmm. uh, and if you're a good actor and you have a love for it know that you can improve the people who just book off the bat like that are like one percent you know you always hear those stories just walked in the room and started booking stuff it's a tiny percentage most everybody pays their dues so you can get better but don't make a demo because you're the class that you're taking you know is selling demos you know be, be sure be sure that you're competitive that's great advice thank you what is something that you wish actors understood better about what you guys do the contracts Absolutely, positively. If you are in this room, that means you're a SAG member, is that right? Okay. And the contracts are all over the SAG website, right? Yep. Okay. Know those. Know those. Know those. And then there is no problem with what happens when you get paid and you know what's coming, you know what to expect, et cetera, et cetera. That will help you with your agent more than anything else. Make sure you get any extra information about the job up front preferably when you audition. In other words, usage, rate, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure that you get all the information you can. Know the business of your business. And I've had people who, oh, yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they book eight jobs in a row, the same thing. How much does that pay? <laughs> what are you doing with the checks that you're getting? <laughs> Look at that. That's how much it pays. And, 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 and it can be confusing. Mm -hmm. On the reuse, yeah. it can be confusing because you get it and it goes to theatrical or they use it on uh, YouTube. or you know, it, So know where your money's coming from. And you have an extraordinary resource here you know, to, yes. to ask. So you make use of what's at your fingertips. Right. So this is, a, I guess, a tricky one for me. I, I, I like to spoil my actors, but um, I guess in voiceover, so few people get access to the type of stuff that we get access to as voiceover agents. Commercial on camera, there are a ton of agents out there, but voiceover, it's such a select few that really get everything that you guys wanna do from, 
from the big commercial campaigns to the network promos to the animated features and animated series. But I wish that they understood that um, because they're on my roster, I am presenting them to the whole of the voiceover world. And it's very unique to have the access to the type of copy that I have access to. And I wish they realized that um, uh, since I'm giving them all the scripts I'm giving them, that they're doing great. So meaning I f booking doesn't matter to me. If I think somebody's really good, I'm gonna feed them scripts over and over again. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is um, if you're with me and I'm giving you scripts, I wish everybody just understood the shit's fine. Everything's okay. You know, the you're shit's fine. You don't fine. need to worry about <laughs> You don't need to worry about booking and you don't need to worry about, you know, listen, if I stop sending you auditions, then maybe there's right. a little bit of a problem. But I just wish they realized that um, since I'm feeding them scripts and I am one of the very few people that have access to all the stuff I have access to, that everything's okay. Focus on your career. You don't have to worry about if you're doing okay or not, so to speak, if you know what I mean. So um, I do, and I think that that's a lovely thing to say and a good thing for all of us to hear because I know as actors, you know, getting feedback or getting no feedback, whichever it is, there's this fear of, oh my God, it has to be this, I have to book it right. or else I'm not, you know Voice that. Voiceover can mm. be like reading into a black hole sometimes. Yeah, right. I'm reading and my reading and, and nobody's hearing anything. Well, the great thing about my agency is I know they're listening, I do. I know they're all listening to my audition. So um, uh, if you're not booking, it's just because it's not the moment for you, most likely. You know, It's not because you're not good, and it's not because I'm doing something wrong, and it's not because you're doing something wrong. It's because it just hasn't clicked yet. And um, you know, the, like I said, it takes years. It, yeah. The people that just book like that are the 1% the of 1%. So you know, it takes a little while, and um, you know, the, Sometimes the check-ins are like, you know, I haven't booked anything, you know, and I'm like, maybe you shouldn't tell me that shit, you know, maybe that's, <laughs> maybe that's something you should keep to yourself, because right. I'm still sending you auditions. Yeah, you know? good. Speaking of auditions, let's talk a little bit about the audition process and how it works at your agencies. Um, do you have studios in-house? Do your, uh, do your roster have at-home setups? And if so, do you have specific requirements of that? Um, and do you coach them and or give feedback and ask for alternate second third takes etc yeah so i most definitely have a studio in-house and it's one of the pillars of my agency i feel that having a studio and this is you know not uh, because of technology not a lot of people feel the exact same way but because of sort of the way i have my roster set up i feel like it's the only way i can really know my talent is by having them you know, in and recording with me. Now, listen, a lot of my busiest people do most of their stuff from home, but if they're not working necessarily all the time, a lot of my people come in um, and I feel like I get to know them that way. Um, they get FaceTime with me um, and that's important. If you're, if you're with a voiceover agency and you never go in and they have a booth, that is a mistake. I promise you, it is good to go in. Um, the, the, to get off, not off topic, but on topic, but if you happen to have five auditions, that's not necessarily the day to go in because that's most likely a day where everybody has a bunch of auditions and you're just gonna clog up the works. It's a day where you have maybe one good TV thing or one good animation thing where you can go in, press flesh with your agent um, and, you know, and, and get seen. Um, so, but I'm also kind of uh, uh, bad in that I don't require my clients to have home studios. Many agencies require their clients to have home studios. I do not require it. Um, as a matter of fact, I do sessions at my office all the time without charging the actor or the producer for any of it. So it's, it is a pillar of my agency, mm -hmm. without question. The booth is so important to me. Great. Uh, my agency does not have a booth. Uh, we're on the edge of the 134 freeway in a glass <laughs> building. And that just didn't really translate to being user-friendly. Yeah. Um, it's so funny you said that I literally am moving to the, an office on the 134 <laughs> class. I swear to God, I really am. <laughs> That's impossible that you just said that. 
<laughs> One word, foam core. <laughs> lots and lots of foam core. Uh-huh. The, the audition process has changed to the point that when I first began, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to be an agent because, is because when I was a receptionist, all the VO people would come into the office and they were fascinating people. They were just, and you know, they were celebrities and scale actors and you, know, you couldn't, couldn't meet anyone like that anywhere else in any of the job. Uh, and that's not the case anymore. I was just devastated when I heard that we don't make people come in and do this anymore. I said, that's, that's part of the fun. Uh, but I am not an actor. And so I am also not an acting teacher, so I'm not going to tell voice actors how to read something. I'm assuming that you know far more than I do. But I do know what ad agencies like, and I do know what the uh, casting people are looking for, because I talk to them many times a week. And so when I hear something that's not going to cut it, I call them back and I say, you know what, we need to redo this. We have to redo this. You cannot, cannot do this. I also am a little bit suspect with people who get me the audition back by the time I've sent it out. Mm. Because I, I, that didn't really impress me that they've thought a lot about it. Mm-hmm. And it needs to be thought through. I mean, it need, you know, my, my, I mean, if there's any wisdom I have to impart just not being an actor, it is do a take as soon as you get the copy and leave it alone. And come back a day later, two days, it depends on how much time. You come back to it with a fresh ear and a fresh set of eyes, and you either say, okay, I can build on this and build on this, but get rid of that, or we start all from scratch, or that's not bad. Because let's be honest, no one's audition is booked and put on the air. The final cut is 66 takes of cutting and editing, and it's of you going hoarse in the booth saying thank you 66 times. Um, It can get excruciating, I'm sure. But your audition is supposed to catch their interest. So above all else, make it interesting. Now, it's hard to do that if you're the only one who hears it. So come to this office. Come to the the booth that they have here. Take advantage, again, of of the resources that are here because you, who knows? You could, uh, you know, bring your coach with you. You can do anything on your own that you could do if I had a studio. But you might have to pay a dollar a minute for it or two dollars a minute for it at VoiceCaster. I, I don't know. There are video and goes all around town. Um, I wish we did have a booth because it would be uh, a real good idea uh, or in a real good way uh, for me to stay in visual contact with my actors. As it is, that's a problem I have. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't really answer about listening back to auditions. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's a big promo campaign or a big promo audition, almost every promo audition I listen to for sure back. Um, every big TV audition these days, I listen to no question. Interactive, probably not. Um, animation, maybe it's just so subjective. I just know that I put my beasts on there and they're gonna make me look good. So, um, but big promo, big TV campaigns, no doubt I listen to those without question and of course i will redirect if i don't like something no Mm -hmm. doubt about it yeah okay and are there any mics that you guys recommend i know a lot of us have the um audio technica or the the 2020 or the snowball how do you well the snowball mic is not Mm -hmm. high enough quality no Mm -hmm. question about it You, you the this belief that you can have average quality out there and have a successful voice of your career is laughable i i i honestly i used to um, just act like I didn't like, like quality didn't really matter just so everybody out there would think quality doesn't really matter. And my competitors would just keep sending in crappy auditions. But at this point, it's, it's, it's so tough to think you're going to compete with, I mean, my people and Mike's people and the people at other agencies with great equipment, you know, it's the, it's, it's like being a supermodel and sending in a blurry picture. You're popping your peas and you think you're gonna book something. And, and what people have to realize is 
um, the, the first round through of listening to a voiceover for a casting director is elimination. They have 200 voices to listen to to get to one. So the first read, listen through, is going to be five seconds looking to eliminate you. And bad quality is the first thing that's going to get you eliminated. So they listen through five seconds. Yes, I'll listen back. No, 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 yes, no. And then they have 20 names. And then they can really listen back in earnest. Because if you've ever tried to pick one voice out of 100, the process of elimination is the only way. And these are human beings we're talking about, too. These aren't robots that are listening. And they think, this is my project. It's really important. And you're going to do it on a crappy mic? Uh, now, they're, it's also, the town is also filled with, oh, I booked it off my phone in an airport. <laughs> well, most likely, you were a request or something, or the client knows you already. or That's really the only way. But to book something first time as a new voice actor on your phone, the chances are minuscule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quality matters, no doubt. I, I don't really have anything to add. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, perfect. So along those lines, is there any truth to, you already sort of touched on this about the Insta turnaround and not loving that idea, but in terms of the deadline that you're given and um, is there any validity to the idea that the early bird does get the worm in terms of getting that submission in and is there more likelihood that casting will listen to it kind of heard hubbub of that well promos for sure mm -hmm. promos are same day if you're if you're going to compete in promos in this town you got to get back audition same day or next day immediately commercials maybe 24 hours animation interactive as long as they'll give you mm -hmm. um it's it is we have turned it into a speed race a little bit and that's you know partially our fault that's a little technology's fault it's also the agent's fault for trying to out compete with each other with speed um but for promos it is a, it is a race mm -hmm. I, I really believe that if, if i'm working on a promo i make it do same day mm -hmm. uh, because i truly believe <laughs> that as soon as that network finds the right voice they're moving on that's it okay yeah, yeah. i believe that uh we don't participate in promos uh, just because we've, I mean, we have a staff of one and you're looking at him. Uh, and he's, he's, he's extremely lazy, so. You know. he's, he's so fired, he really is. Fired. Um, so uh, uh, we're down to commercials, animation, interactive, and it really, frankly, depends on the casting director. And you start learning who will, you know, who is going to email you two hours after they put it out yeah. and say, do you have anything for me yet? Mm -hmm. So you tend to remember those. Yep. And then there are some animation producers who just, you know, get it to me by the end of the month. Yeah. You know, we're not even going to listen to anything until Christmas. Wow. Well, okay, sure. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, even then, I, I've got to believe that the quality of your audition is going to make a lot more difference than the speed in which you get it in right. within reason <laughs> okay don't get it to me three days after it works that's no good to anybody it could be great and they're still not going to use you mm -hmm. take the time to break it down you've been trained use your training use your skills get it right send it in boom and that's it if that takes a day it takes a day if it takes two days it's fine but make sure you're sending the best read you can possibly give, regardless of what it is. And I wanted to take a quick break here. Mike already mentioned the VO Lab. Just in case anybody is not making use of it, it's such an incredible resource for us, you guys. And we can also record our auditions there. And there's an amazing engineer, and she will just throw it on a thumb drive for you, and you are good to go. It is seriously dreamy. Use it. Okay. Okay. Um, so, what trends are you seeing right now? What's new and different, and what is changing, or what's not changing? I should say, either or. Thoughts? Podcast. Podcast. Let's talk about podcasts. podcasts. That's one of somebody asked a question about that. So yeah. And uh, if there are any SAG contract people in here, please go to the podcast people and write down, take notes that needs to be improved. What else? Dubbing? Oh, dub, dubbing. dubbing for sure, mm -hmm. no yeah. question. Anime and dubbing. Uh, the contract is 25 years old and um, it is the, one of the busiest areas of voiceover. 
and it's like sixty eight dollars plus ten per hour to for dubbing. Um, so non union pays more. Non union dubbing pays more than union does, and since there are no residuals, it's uh, you know it's it's a tough one. But yeah, so that's a great point. Dubbing is absolutely on fire, and the rates are horrendous. Um, and and the producers know that uh, there's this big uh, convention. Uh, we're in the world of conventions now where anime conventions are actually paying the talent's uh, wages because Funimation and all the places know, well, if this turns into a big anime series, they can go to conventions and make money selling their autographs. So, um, so these you know new young actors coming in are not saying no to this non-union stuff like they used to, even though it's $100 an hour, because they know that they can go to a convention and sell their autograph and make a little bit of money mm -hmm. and get a little bit of internet fame for it too. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, anime, that needs some serious work because it is so popular um, and the fans are so rabid. So um, <laughs> that, that really needs to, be, the, the union needs to step up there, step mm -hmm. up. And in terms of the voices that are being used, are you seeing any changes in terms of what's in fashion right now and what may not be in fashion? In which area are we talking about? Uh, in any, really, but you know, just in terms of um, if it's commercial or animation or promos, are well, you know, for the longest time we were talking about this in the green room, the the kind of like warm male voice was it for right. a long, long time. Well, for promos specifically, um, the big voiced guy has been king, and this is promos and trailers, pretty much for the last decade, even fifteen years. Now in promos, the big voice guy is slipping a little bit. It's really more of a mid range guy, and then of course women are coming into more promos than they ever have. Um, you know, luckily I have one of the comedy voices of NBC that's a, um, an, a female actor. So um, uh, m more mid-range in the promo area, without question. Um, a lot more females in promos. And then commercially, I mean, for women, it is going off right now. Mm. I mean, there are more women selling cars and beers and financials than there ever has been. Um, I think, you know, t 10 years ago, they said they wanted women. Um, and now they really are hiring women. I mean, it's, it is crazy how many more women are being hired for commercials. Right. Um, animation is nailing jokes. It's not about wacky character voices, yep. as I said. Um, it's more about reality. They want real kids instead of women necessarily, unless it's adult material. So mm -hmm. those are the most prevalent trends. Yeah. Commercially, um, probably when, about the time I began, uh, as an agent, they stopped wanting the professional voice. Mm -hmm. And now they want the voice that the professional has told to go out and tell everybody else. So we're not hearing from your doctor anymore. We're hearing from you talking to you about what my doctor said is that, well, what Chevrolet says is and da 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 da. Because apparently we can't trust smart people anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure where we came to that. <laughs> Constant trends, they touch everything. <laughs> but seriously though, I mean, you, you, it's, it's as though, it's as though advertisers do not want to talk down to anybody. They don't want to say, I'm smarter than you, therefore come buy this. And let's face it, there's only one point to any commercial. Every commercial has had the same goal or the same message. Buy this to make your life better whether it's medicine or cars or mm -hmm. whatever it is. If you buy this, your life will be improved. And I, I, I agree with that trend as well, and I kind of put it in, in almost another way. There, the celebrity read has been popular for like 15 years, and what that kind of means to me is like intimate, conversational, uh, like Liev Schreiber would sound. Um, but now it's a little bit more backed off the mic, um, a, a tiny bit more testimonial, if you will, a little more projection. Um, everything is not as intimate a, as it has been for the last 10 years. So and it kind of goes to what you're saying. You were kind of telling somebody about what somebody else told you. So I backed off the mic a little, a little more projection of st still, of course, conversational without question. I mean, the big announcer voice still accounts for a good five to 10% of all advertising, even though people say, think it's dead. Mm -hmm. You will still find big announcer in a, in a large amount of advertising. 
um, and, and union advertising too, but 90% is gonna be, you know, um, women, diversity, um, and, and I do feel that's a little bit more backed off the mic, not quite as, what again, I called it the celebrity read for so many years. I think it's a little more projected and backed off the mic. Mm -hmm. and radio is absolutely home of the big announcer because you can get away mm -hmm. with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, or the big joke or the big sound effect yeah. or anything like that. Great. While we are either looking for representation or just freshly signed or even someone who wants to kind of keep their chops up, what kind of research do you recommend that we do? Obviously continue to train and take classes and workshops, but um, is there any particular research that you think is valuable for us to be doing? Improv for sure, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I, think, I think theater actors make great voice actors. I think comedians, stand-up comedians make great voice actors. Um, but, you know, instead of taking the, the fifth voiceover class in a row, maybe take some improv and get out of your mm -hmm. comfort zone a little bit because timing is everything. Um, so much of voiceover is comedy based, whether it's commercial, like I said, animation, or just being, being likable. Um, likability is so underrated in voiceover. And the timing um, that comedians have or timing that you can learn from improv can really make you more likable and therefore more bookable. Right. Acting class. Yeah. Acting class. I mean, because mainly because of animation and of interactive. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, if I, having no training or ever read for five thousand commercials, chances are I might might get a call back on one. <laughs> okay. Okay. But that's without any training. Right. Okay. If you train as an actor, you you learn how to break down scenes, you learn how to get to the point, you learn how to be entertaining while you do it. That's animation. Mm-hmm. So learn to act and then learn how to do animation and then learn how to do interactive. Right. But I mean, it's so many people just go, you know, straight up at an angle yeah. and learn booth etiquette and think they can go in and do animation. Now that's just not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You forget it's, it's an acting job. It's a voiceover, but if you've been training to be an actor, you've been training for voiceover. So do you think that there's any value in focusing on one specific genre? If you have a natural ability for let's say promo is there any value in going this is what i'm going to do i'm going to harness it i'm going to go for it rather than i'm just going to throw spaghetti at the voiceover wall and see what happens you know <laughs> i think it's a great question right now just because of the time we're in um so when i first got in this business uh in the late 90s it's that was kind of the beginning of the great separation voiceover um prior to that people that did voiceover did promos, they did commercials, they did animation, they did a little bit of everything. When I got into it, started the time where agencies started separating their departments into promos, commercials, and animation. And if you were with somebody commercially, you weren't necessarily with them promo-wise. Now, the, the dates are a little off. It was really in the 90s that this happened, but, but you know, ICM even didn't really, where I started, really Jeff Danis just ran everything pretty much and we had a separate animation department. Um, but as soon as I got there, we started to separate into promos, commercials, and animation. And all for the last 20 years, that big separation has been happening. You know, if you're at a big agency commercially, you might not read a piece of promo. And if you're with them commercially and promo wise, God knows you ain't gonna be reading any animation. And a lot of the big agencies are still that way. Um, but the way that the business has gone, I've kind of gone, I've rever reverted back. My best actors are doing everything. My best actors are doing promos, they're doing commercials, they're doing animation. I'm finding that the best voice actors are the best voice actors. Um, because the promo producers want the good acting sound or the good comedic, comedic sound that the actors bring. Um, they don't need, you know, you, you go to promo classes, and the teacher's like, okay, we got to connect that first line with the third line and then wrap it all up at the end. And really, they're just booking people in promos that just sound good reading it. That's the truth. They don't care that you connected the first line and the third line. Um, and like I said, animation is all comedy based. Um, and then um, commercials are honesty and likability. And the same voice actors are booking all of those things now. So um, right now in 2020, I feel like 
I want somebody who's going to book it all. I do. Mm-hmm. And, and, and my best people are doing that exact thing. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that there's anyone who can specialize mm-hmm. and, and frankly, at a, at a scale level anyway, yeah. um, make a living. I mean, you have got to be able to do as many things as possible as an actor in order to have the career. And if you make a few dollars in animation and you think you want to get into promo, you know, I, I, I was going to say go to class, but I don't know if that's, you know, in light of your comment, I don't know if that's true now. Mm-hmm. But you have to know something about it. Right. And so just saying, I want to read for promo, the agent's going to shut the door right on your nose. Come to me when you have something to tell me. Yeah. You know, don't just say, I want to do it. Mm-hmm. I mean, there are still, you know, five or six guys with big voices out there that have trailer and promo careers. Right. Ashton Smith, Scott Rummel, you know, uh, Howard Parker and John Gary. But that's a f- small group and it's shrinking um, without question. There's very few voices on movie trailers anymore. It's just a date, a title card and a rating. And, uh, you know, the, you go to a movie, there's nobody narrating the movie trailers. They rather put text on the screen for you to read as opposed to having uh, an announcer narrate it for you. So it's, a, it's really not the best time for trailer guys, so to speak. Uh, point of privilege here. Can, where does most of your promo stuff run? Network. Okay. Do you have any radio? Only promo? during sweeps. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> great. All right, so I have a bunch of great questions, so I'm just going to start kind of reading these. Um, this is interesting. So if if an actor has something that could be seen as a restriction in terms of a strong value system that they're feeling very passionately about and they don't necessarily feel comfortable representing certain brands, how would you deal with that as an agent? So it was start over again? If, if you have an actor, uh-huh. or you're interested in an actor, uh-huh. and they have certain kind of... Um, like they don't want to sell beer or something? Uh, perhaps. Vegan. Vegan. How would you deal with that? Well, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, um, the, the place where I'll draw the line is political. I, I'll accept, I mean, I, what I like to say is, listen, if you're Republican and don't want to read for Democrats, just donate the money to your party and let me get my 10%, you know. Um, uh, but leave your politics at home. That's the honest truth. I mean, listen, the hypocrisy is absurd. If we want to really start looking at who we're, getting our money from, it's big oil, it's big fast food, it's, it's not something you want to start scratching the surface of. Mm-hmm. Seriously, it's, uh, it's ugly what we're doing, it really is. Mm-hmm. Sorry. <laughs> not sorry. <laughs> There's no way I'm gonna follow that. Okay, okay. <laughs> Then we'll just leave it alone. All right. Now, what I would do is I would say we're going to take this on a project-by-project basis. Because if they throw enough money at you, you will eat that hamburger. (laughs) (laughs) So... so, uh, I just have visions of you shoving a hamburger down a client. (laughs) I represented an actor who wanted to do interactive and animation. And he... I got a call from a session and he said, Dean, I'm sorry, but there's cursing in this script and I won't curse. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, but the the, the audition didn't have any cursing in it, so I thought it was fine. I mean, my jaw is still slack about it. I didn't know what to say. He had to pull out of the session because he didn't curse. And the hypocrisy of it all is no problem blowing somebody's head off with a gun, but he mm. said shit, so we couldn't do it. So I just, the, the whole hypocrisy thing of stuff like that, it's just too, it's too messy. Yeah. It's too messy to have, to let your politics get in the way, mm-hmm. you know. Um, you know, it, yeah, we'll, we'll move on from that. Great. Okay. 
So this is a mocap and voiceover question. They're two distinct genres, but they're oftentimes kind of put in the same job. Um, should someone that works in mocap, motion capture, and voiceover uh, be specifically looking for a voiceover agent and a motion capture agent, or is there a both in there? Um, and what are the pros and cons of that? And given the immediacy of certain contracts, uh, how can a person hypothetically get a, an agency to sign them rather than hip pocket them for negotiating said contract? Well, <laughs> there's, there's, there really aren't any motion capture agencies. I mean, there might be one or two possibly, but um, really, um, the casting directors have a group of people that they know um, are really good at fighting, are really good at choreography, are really good at movement, and they hire those people. Um, the cool thing about right now is um, these companies have figured out, uh, plays like Ubisoft, they figured out that um, if they have the people up in Canada do all the movement, and then they hire Americans to do the voiceover, they have to hire a third company to sync up all that voiceover with the on-camera. So right now, the rage is just have the voiceover guys do the motion capture. Um, so it is, my clients are doing more motion capture than they've ever done before uh, because it's just less expensive. And apparently, uh, from what I understand, syncing up voices uh, to the movement is really expensive. So. Um, I would say if you want to do motion capture, you get with one of the good agencies that do a lot of interactive. Um, you know, as far as hip pocketing, I mean, the truth is I don't have any clients signed. I don't even have contracts. Mm. Um, all of my clients are just handshake deals. So what I would say to being hip pocket is, are you getting auditions? If you're getting auditions, you're fine. Um, but if you're hip pocketed and not getting auditions and he's just commissioning that one gig, then that's not a very good deal for you. But I wouldn't worry about being hip pocketed as long as you're getting auditions. Mm -hmm. Yes, as long as you're active. Yep. Yeah. An active part of the roster. Right. Okay, so. Just to, because I always have, you know, what I call a testing board, so to speak, new, fresh people. Because if I give, the, it's the same casting directors over and over again in voiceover. It's the same people in commercial, it's the same people in animation, it's the same people in interactive. So if I just keep feeding them, because my roster's tight, it really is very tight. If I keep feeding the same eight to 10 people, they're gonna get a little bit bored. So I always have these new, fresh, different actors that I like to pepper in there. and what happens is the good ones get recognized. Um, and I, I'll make sure I give them enough opportunities. And, um, you know, you can kind of tell pretty early on who, who kind of gets it. So, um, so hip pocketing is a good thing. Great. So this is regarding voicebank.net being taken over by voices.com. Can you address this? Because uh, their experience is that their VO friends are having fewer auditions because of this. And what are agents doing to get their clients more audition opportunities? I'm not sure if this is two s different questions, but voicebank.net being taken over by voices.com, does that have an effect? It has. Yeah. It has a big effect. It's had a very big effect mm -hmm. uh, in ways you may not have thought of because. I am not on Voices.com I, I, or anything like that, nor do I encourage my clients to go on that. Um, I don't like their business practices, mm -hmm. and I don't like the rate that they put out for the work that's to be done. Um, and I, unfortunately for all these low rate jobs and stuff like that, non-union versus union, as long as there is an actor who will audition for a $100 job, you'll still have $100 jobs. So. Talk to that guy. It's his fault. Voice Bank was purchased by Voices.com and with an eye toward taking that entity and turning it into Voices.com Bank, in effect. They wanted to deal with agencies and bigger projects. Well, the agency said, that, you know, too bad. We don't like you and we don't want to do that with you. So you just keep paying to play and we'll go do our thing. What that's left agents with is uh, 
jumping up and down, waving our hands, making sure everyone has our email address, making sure that we're on the short list, making sure that this, 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 this. So, I mean, you have to go hunting sometimes. You have to go hunting and you have to say, you have to call ad agencies and say, who does your casting? You know, and, and you just do a reverse. You go back and see who's booked with that agency. What's their payroll company? And then you chase it back that way. Wow. It's, a, it's a tough road. Yeah. But if you do it, you get results. Mm -hmm. And that yields, uh, makes dividends for your people. Thank you. Yeah, so the, uh, the Voice Bank being purchased by Voices was a real shame. Um, disappointing, to say the least. Um, but it's what happened nothing we're not reverting back we're not putting the toothpaste back in the tube so um the the tricky part is as mike said is you've got to go out hunting and you used to be able to call up an advertising agency and just say hey can i talk to broadcast production and you could get through to broadcast production now they don't even have a phone number you know mm. so advertising is reverted back into these little cubicles within advertising agencies um, and the broadcast production departments have been farmed out or shrunk down to almost nothing so it is far different than it was when I started 20 years ago um, you know with that said you just have to make sure you have great voice actors when they give you the opportunity um, you know, make sure you send in good auditions, uh, good high quality auditions, so they want to consider your people in the future. Um, you know, but you do have to go after commercials a lot more than you used to. We, we got a little, you know, for lack of a better term, fat and lazy with Voice Bank a little bit. We knew it was going to come into us. Um, and the, there are a lot of really good non-union voice actors out there around the country and it's not just los angeles and new york and chicago anymore um you know florida and philly and and the flyover states have great talented voice actors and at the end of the day it's reading somebody else's written words off a page for money it's not digging a ditch and if you offer somebody a couple hundred bucks, they're going to take it no matter what it is. Mm -hmm. So, so with all of that combined, um, you know, and Voice Bank was mostly commercial. Um, so, with all that combined, it has made the commercial world a different animal than it was five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. Do either of you represent non-local actors? Few. I yeah. represent a few. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. Just interested. Okay. Yeah. And well, here's why: because I. I I don't have a way to sell them. Mm. I mean, I can sell them around town by sending them to the few people who do auditions in their studios still. Mm -hmm. And they, I mean, they get exposure. They get exposed that way. I can't send anyone from Atlanta. Right. Town. It's just, and it's, it's a, it's, to me, it's too much of a disconnect. Mm -hmm. And there are too many talented people that I can pick from the first four rows right here. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, first four rows. <laughs> well, and all the rows back, too. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, right there. Yay, row 10. All the way in the back. There you go. Yeah. Great. Great. All right. Um, when you receive an audition, do you submit every single submission that you get from your roster if they've auditioned for you? So I do not call auditions. I, my roster is small enough where it's not necessary for me to call auditions unless it says top five or unless it says top 10. Then in that case, if it says top 10, I will send it to 12 or 13 actors because you send it to 12 or 13, you get 10 auditions back. Um, it, you know, cause somebody's always out of town. If I happen to get 11, you know, and it's top 10, I might just get a little piggy and send 11. Um, uh, but the only time I call auditions is if it's a top five and it's only one or two maybe, um, but, you know, if they ask for top five and you send six and you're a reputable agency, they're not going to give you a hard time. Is that common to get a top three, top five, top ten? Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. I will, actually, I will send probably 20 and listen to them and send the five that I like the best. I just thought because, I mean, there are just, there are just some people who are better at reading certain types of copy. For sure. And if I know that so-and-so through so and so, we're going to give you something good, and this guy might. Then you know, let's hear them all. I don't have to 
you know, inundate them. I will say if it's a promo audition, I will send it to everyone, almost everyone, to give them a shot like that, to be honest, because I find the promos being so widely varied of skill level. So I really, if, even if it's a top five, I will send it every single client I think that has a chance um, and then cut it down. So that's the one instance that I will uh, do that exact thing. So no, that's super for valuable me think. for us to know. Yeah. Thank you. What is the best strategy for a bilingual voiceover talent? One more time. What is the best strategy for a bilingual voiceover talent? Do you focus on the foreign language or is that limiting? Well, it depends if you have no accent in both, you know. Um, you know, I have uh, a female actor that is perfect Spanish and perfect English and she's crushing it. Um, but if you're a Spanish is average and your English is average, you're just going to be caught in the middle. You're, you're, you really do have to be perfect. You're, you know, so if your Spanish is perfect, you have to be first language Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, if She's you're a native book. speaker. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So most likely I would focus on Spanish. Um, but diversity is really a great thing right now. So an interactive, I think you could have a really good career commercially, not necessarily, but interactive, I think, could be a good time. I'm so, I know you're about to. Um, answer to that. I just had a kind of tag along on that. Is it true that I if you are not native to a certain um, ethnicity or nationality that you will not be seen for accented work at this point? Absolutely. I mean, white guys and girls can get away with Eastern European these days, but that's it. Mm -hmm. They're not reading for Asian, Hispanic. Um, no, it's over. That is done. Yeah. yeah. Accents uh, can work for you or against you. And if they want an accent, they'll pick you. If they mm -hmm. don't want an accent, they're going to pick someone else. Right. So stick to what you're good at. I mean, if you can find a way to lose a native accent, then by all means, you know, have, live uh, even up the playing field. But if they want a Texan to read the copy, they are going to find a Texan to read the copy. <laughs> so accents, dialects, languages, while fun, are probably going to be relegated to uh, sort of a hyper animated type of project or even interactive. But truth in advertising is, for some reason, suddenly important. <laughs> and so, so now, now they want someone who's actually British. Do not send anybody who's not from the island. You know. So yeah. But uh, speaking of accents, um, specifically in, in the interactive space. Um, it's not good enough anymore to just do a generic Southern or a generic Western. You really have to up your accent game. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, an accent throughout the Midwest and a lot of places, it's kind of rural and it's not Southern and not all the words have a rural sound to them. Some of them are perfectly normal, almost like Yat has some perfectly normal, but then other ones are not. If you're going to do accents, really, you know, up your game. Um, it, if you're just going to do generic Southern, I, I recommend, you know, listening to people who really are from those areas and finding those certain words that they say in an interesting way. Um, or like Kate Winslet did a, a role for the Steve Jobs movie where she was um, from some indistinguishable Scandinavian country. But not only did she do the accent, she did the thing where the, she put the accent on the wrong syllable, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, it, she took it to this next level where she just didn't do the Scandinavian accent. She did it like they do, where they, they get the wrong accent, you know? Or they get the, the stress on the wrong syllable. So and the, the people you're competing against are so good. Take it to that next level. Think about, um, you know, what it really sounds like uh, in real life, not just straight out of central casting accents. It's just not good enough anymore. Are there voiceover agents that specialize in actors who sing voiceover singing? Is that a special? Well, agent? jingles are different. Mm -hmm. jingles, jingles are a whole commercial thing in a different world. And I think they even have their own contracts and everything, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. But um, the, the trend without question in animation is to have the actors sing now. They used to have a singing voice and the voiceover voice. Now they don't want to spend that money and they want the voice actor to do the singing. So um, anybody that's doing any current animation auditions will 
will find it they want to hear 16 bars of a pop song at the end of the audition and it is extremely popular to have voice actors do the singing now great i think we've pretty much covered except let's talk about social media presence and is it important? And are there preferences in terms of platforms? <laughs> Social media is wonderful. It is, it's the way we communicate now. But if you are auditioning for a project, don't put it on social media. Mm. Or Disney will come get you. Did you get that email today? Yeah, so I got the email today. <laughs> <laughs> Do not brag that you got audition okay just say love my agent he sent me another thanks <laughs> mike odell you know <laughs> but to mention it by name is to almost literally get get blackballed and and maybe open yourself up for some litigation and and that's yeah i mean that really is uh, what it's about now and and anyone in here who has ever auditioned for anything for Apple or for Samsung knows what an NDA is. Mm -hmm. And we signed those things and they're just another thing now. But the reason that that started was iPhone 6, okay, was left in, a, in a, an airport bar. And someone picked it up and said, what's this? And na 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 And it really, really made Steve Jobs mad. Okay, so he started wanting NDAs for anyone and everyone who was going to be subjected to his work, including advertising, and that's where that all began. Now, you are being trusted not to divulge this brand new Disney TV show that they are casting for ahead of its release. And when you audition for that and you brag about it on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever, then that's what you're not supposed to do. So, no, 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 that's bad. Everything else, a booking, uh, a series lead, I mean, all that stuff, please post it. I mean, that's, that's the only way that you're going to get credited for it day after day after day after day. And that's just monstrous. It's huge. I mean, even if you don't book an awful lot, if you are known as a voiceover actor on social media, people are going to know you're a voice actor. Mm -hmm. And they are going to say, how's it going? Oh, I know a voice actor. You should read this person. We get referrals on that stuff. You've got to read this person. They're great. Or the casting director just calls you and says the same thing. It's just really opened things up. And, and I like it. I like right. it, provided you don't misuse it. Mm -hmm. I think um, talent is still king, no doubt. So what I mean by that is, do I think that Disney or Nickelodeon is sitting in a room and say it's between this girl and this girl, but this one has a social media presence, let's hire her. I don't believe that conversation is going on. I really don't. Um, are we getting to a place where that will happen? Yeah, I think we really are getting to a place where that will happen. I don't think it's happening now. But with that said, I certainly encourage my clients to use social media uh, intelligently. Um, you know, Instagram and Twitter, I, I think, are the mo most important ones, in my opinion, for what we do. I think Instagram is the future, but that's just my opinion mm -hmm. for our business specifically. Um, but I, you know, 15 years ago, I would have said a completely different story. I would have said, you want to be famous for being a voice actor? You're in the wrong business. Um, but things have changed. 15 years later, people find voice actors really interesting and they want to know the voice behind their favorite characters. Um, I didn't think that that was going to be a thing, um, but about 10 years ago, I realized that I was wrong and that it, that it is a thing and people go to conventions and spend $20 to get an autograph with their favorite voice actor. So um, I think social media is very important. Um, use it smart. The old director of Disney TV animation uh, was talking to me when Voice Bank went away and they were making the rounds trying to meet you know all the agents that they really didn't know very well it's Mike Mike Wright yeah. and he said uh, if we are down to two people and we know we have to sp we're planning on spending three to five years working with that person and we can't decide we do go to social media mm -hmm. and we see that's a you know it's kind of a, an extra way of vetting 
you know, literally, do you want to spend more time with this person or with this person? This person has, you know, dead cats and everything over here. <laughs> and this person has butterflies and rain, but well, let's see. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's another way to vet. It really is. So, no dead cats on Instagram, no anything like that. Remember that it is up to a certain point, particularly if you are looking to live life in the public eye, that's a work tool and make sure that there's nothing on there that could be held against you in a professional manner. Mm -hmm. One last question somebody tagged on. Um, can you elaborate the difference between conversational voice and the previous type of perfect voice? Well, conversational just means mimicking real, mm -hmm. real conversation. So that means stopping, starting, speeding up, slowing down. Um, conversational just means mimicking real life speech patterns. And uh, when you get a piece of copy and you robotically go through it without changing pace, that's not conversational. Um, so to me, what conversational means is mimicking real life speech patterns. And people stop, they start, they speed up, they slow down. Um, commercially, you're kind of stuck in a, in a projection. You need to pick are you going to be in this intimacy or are you going to project a little more? I don't feel like changing intimacy and projection and commercials is that smart, but changing pace to me is everything and mimicking your own natural speech patterns, understanding your own natural speech patterns and learning to accentuate them turns you into a prototype. Um, so that's why voiceover can take so long because a lot of people don't understand what makes them unique and what makes them interesting. And once you find out what makes you unique and what makes you interesting, accentuating that um, makes you someone that they want to hire, you know, because only you know your natural speech patterns. Now, if you're just a bore speaking, I'm sorry, you're probably in the wrong <laughs> business, but um, most people have something interesting that they do. And so conversational is mimicking real life speech patterns, most likely your own real life speech pattern. Yeah, it's, it sounds like you're saying be the you version of you. Yeah, it's the same way, you know, the same, same way as saying that. That's why everybody always says you can't try to imitate someone else. You need to make it your own. And, and it, it's absolutely true. Um, but listen, if you're really good at mimicking somebody that's interesting and you can do it, shit, go for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't go for the presidential read. There are so many people trained. The minute they get in the booth, <clears throat> <clears throat> bear aspirin. It works for you. Mm -hmm. No. No. Yeah, yeah, right. That's not conversational. Mm -hmm. If you ever run across someone who converses like that, go away. No one talks that <laughs> run way. Run for the hills. They're about to pull out the chainsaw. <laughs> How do you sound talking about aspirin? That's the first question you ask. And then they give you everything to say. Mm -hmm. And then you say, well, this is me talking about aspirin. And go, bang. There, and then put it aside, listen to it, see what needs to be pushed up or brought down, and send it in. That's what, I think that's one of the most overthought things. Yeah. One of the most overthought directions. I know a lot of casting directors like lead-ins. I personally like lead-ins, but then I cut them out. You know, I, I, I do think it de-emphasizes the first few words that you say, um, but I don't like to send the lead-in. Um, and, you know, I was at a panel recently and the casting director said, no, I love lead-ins. I think they're fantastic. So I think it's a matter of taste. Um, but I think lead-ins and basically what that is is revving up to the first words by making up a few words. Um, I do think it can be very helpful in de-emphasizing because people tend to really hit the first few things that they mm -hmm. say and it can mm -hmm. kind of stand out to casting yeah. directors. That makes sense. Okay, before we end this incredible evening, I just want to again let you guys know all you have to do is take the orientation at the voiceover lab and all of these incredible resources are available to us for free as SAG-AFTRA members. When you sign up, you have to do two solo booth sessions 
and get to know the software. And then you're able to go into the main booth and there's an incredible sound engineer there for you. And not only can you record your auditions, but they have incredible workshops for commercial work, for promo work. They have voice to picture promos set up in the main booth for you. I mean, it really is so beautiful, such a state of the art facility that is made available for us. So please, please, please make use of it. Do yourself a favor. I cannot thank you guys enough. This has been fantastic. Please thank Dean and Mike. Thank you.